Hi guys, today I'm going to have a look at Portia from Julius Caesar, um, particularly her monologue that starts with, is Brutus sick? This is the one where she finds her, um, she goes out to the garden when Brutus has just been visited by that little secret gang who are like, we should kill Caesar. And she's like, hey, what's going on? You've been kind of weird. Um, and he's like, yeah, I'm just sick. So this is one where you definitely need to know what's happened before because it's very important to kind of get her reaction like why is she reacting like this? How would you react as an actor? Um, and it's a really interesting one because she's a really smart lady. Um, I can't remember. She's the daughter of a general, I think. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly. But she's quite well respected and she's educated. She's smart. And you'll see and you'll hear and you'll feel the way that her monologue flows is quite um, measured. And I say measured because the measures, um, like the rhythm of Shakespeare, of iambic pentameter. So you've got ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum. That's always in what it sounds, what it feels like, what it should feel like in iambic pentameter. If you've got a character that's quite intelligent, often at, and quite in control in the moment when, when they're speaking, their speech will fit quite neatly into that pattern. And if they're a little bit sort of emotional or maybe they're a bit of a crazy character, they tend to fit not as well into that ba dum ba dum ba dum pattern. It will always have the same amount of syllables, so it'll still have the ba dum ba dum technically, but when you say it, it will feel like it's not, instead of the, the horse trotting, da -da, da -da, da -da, it's gonna feel like the horse is going like this. And that's because the character is having inner turmoil. So we're gonna have a little look at how that progresses in the speech and how that rhythm works. And it's a really, really great thing to learn um, to check whenever you're doing a character because it's something that Shakespeare's done on purpose and it can really show you a lot about how to interpret your character and what's going on for them. Once you've understood that, I really like to apply. So if you, if you think you've got a character that's particularly, actually, sorry, let me explain. If you have had a look at that kind of ba-dump, ba -dump feeling, if you've got a character that is quite measured and feels like it's following in the pattern, I go by a particular method that's uh, recommended in the book Mastering Shakespeare. It's a fantastic book, it's really easy to read, um, and I'll link it below. Uh, it has an exercise called Head, Heart, Guts, Groin. This is really, really good for Shakespeare. So, head being that, so at any time in the monologue, you could be feeling head, heart, guts, or groin. The overall monologue also might be kind of head, heart, guts, or groan, um, and you can take it moment to moment. So, for example, I would say that this monologue is kind of a head and hearts, head and heart monologue because she's quite rational. She's trying to reason with this guy, but she also is really, it's a, her marriage feels like it's at stake in the person that she knew, and it tugs at the heartstrings. Monologues that tend to be, or you know, any Shakespeare really, any that tend to be high stakes, high emotion, um, things are crazy, people are dying, they tend to be guts. And then the sexy ones tend to be groin, right? You get the picture. I often find it's often, if you think generally, like what, just generally, what's the vibe of this monologue? I think it's a really good question to ask yourself because you should be able to get a general feel for it just from once you've done your readings and you've kind of checked the meanings and you, you get what's going on. You've done your given circumstances, so you know what comes before. You've got a general idea about this character. What kind of mood is he or she in? So by identifying if they're head, heart, guts or groin, or a bit of a mix of them, often I find it's a head, heart mix or a heart, guts mix. Sometime a gut, sometimes a guts, groin mix or groin can kind of pop up randomly and sometimes can be a whole monologue on its own, the groin monologues. Um, it gives you a little bit of an idea of kind of how much energy and the, the kind of attack that you might bring to the monologue. I don't find this, this, I don't think this monologue has a lot of attack personally, but because <clears throat> she's kind of, I, I would probably play it a little bit fed up because her first words are, 
Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humours of the dark morning? Dark morning? Dark morning. What? Is Brutus sick? I think she's a little bit... She could be sarcastic with him. She could be a little bit frustrated with him. And she's probably responding fairly quickly. Um, or she could also be kind of like cajoling him like, oh, you can't fool me. And it's, you could take any tack you like, but it's good to think about the shape of your model. There's a few things to think about. Oh my goodness, there's so many things to think about. There's a few things to think about. If you're auditioning, I would probably give it a bit more attack, like you're a bit frustrated with him, just because often when someone sees an audition, they want to see you kind of go at it from the beginning. If you build into it, I think, some, especially if it's a self-tape, you can lose people really early on because um, in the first 30 seconds, 10 to seconds even, people can be like, mm, nah, this is not for me. So having that sort of em emotional response to him going, oh, I'm just sick, you know, just go inside. Be like, mm, really, really? But she also has to, she has to reason with him. This is a really good monologue for using actions with because the general feeling is her reasoning with him. So you're going to need a little bit of variety on that, right? So it might be a case of she's cajoling him, she's convincing him, she is um, attacking him. So she's trying different ways. Um, and so if you're someone that does use actions like to attack, to this, to that, um, that can be a good way to make sure that it doesn't just become very one notish. So <clears throat> that could be your first one, for example. So you might start with a bit of a, a bit of sarcasm, like, oh, really? You're sick, are you? And the next bit, and will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? So basically, you're sick, are you? And you're going to get out of bed and go in the, you know, filthy London air that's going to fill your lungs with rubbish um, and make you worse. You could keep going on that level or you could change tack, change tack. I think particularly the wholesome bed is an interesting one. So maybe she's kind of flirting with him there, for example. These are just ideas. Please don't, you know, just take mine and run with it. Please think about your own. Wow. So she might just change the energy a little bit there. Will he steal out of his wholesome bed and come and like, you know, come and flirt with him, for example. Or maybe... Maybe she was just so confused by that that she's like, no, please explain it to me, like trying to involve him in it. Then, no, my Brutus, you have some sick offence within your mind. So sick offence being sick offence within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. So this is very simple language. So no, you're not sick in the body, you're sick in the mind. Something is bothering you and the right and virtue of my place being that I'm married to you, I should know about it. And so I think this is really insightful because this to me is when it starts to really bug her on a personal level. Because to begin with, it's a very intellectual level. Like, yeah, okay, sure, you're going to go outside when it's like freezing and dirty and disgusting and you're sick, aren't you? Okay, that makes sense. She's being very um, intellectual. But as soon as she starts talking about her place, it becomes very personal because I think she takes it very seriously that she's his wife, that she deserves to know that they shouldn't have secrets, that kind of thing. And she goes further into that. So that's where I'd start to kind of bring that in, whether she starts to really open up to him there or whether she's actually, you could play it a different way. You could actually show that her becoming more cold because she's struggling with her own emotions there. Lots of things to dig into. <clears throat> so when we got to, I ought to know it. And upon my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me yourself, your half, why you were heavy, and what men tonight have had resort to you. For here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from dark. Ah, oh, I love this. <laughs> it gives me kind of the cr like chills, like good, good chills. So she says, um, upon my knees I charm you. Now, FYI, if, if it ever says upon my knees, 
you literally need to get upon your knees. It's not a, it's not figurative. <laughs> get on your knees. Um, and it's not a sexual thing. It's just, that's how they, um, show, like, surrender basically like hey look I'm, I, I'm really genuinely asking you um upon my knees I charm you and it's interesting that it says she says charm you not like I beg you I charm you um and she's saying like I, I she is, is saying I beg you but she says it in a different way which I think is even though the word would have had slightly different connotations then I do think that's purposeful where I think Shakespeare is suggesting that she is she is charming she and she says, by my once commended beauty. So she might have a bit of a laugh at that because she knows she's getting a little bit older and she's a little bit sagging around the edges or whatever. But I think she is still beautiful and she is still powerful and she is still smart. And she's she knows that when she was younger, she might have utilized that. And now she's kind of like, well, you know, maybe that's not as powerful, but I still ask you in all, in all my glory, you unfold to me means you let me know yourself, your half, so just basically everything that's going on for you. That is one that I would dig further into because I can't remember why she says your half specifically. Um, I feel like it's your half of the story, but I could be misinterpreting that. Anytime you're making an assumption, make sure you check it in footnotes, in, um, in your uh, Shakespeare glossary, um, in any other text that you can find to make sure you understand it properly and you're not just guessing. You should never assume. Why you are heavy. So heavy is serious and sad. And what men tonight have had to resort to. So who were these people? For here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from darkness. So that's very literal. They were wearing hoods and masks and stuff. Then um, in the version that I've got here, it jumps ahead and says, within the bond of marriage, uh, so sometimes the monologue finishes there and then I've got a little bit more. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself, but as it were, in sort or limitation to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed and talk to you sometimes? Oh, this gets me every time. Oh, my goodness. So in marriage, tell me. Is it, it's interesting because it says accepted here as E-X-C-C, not ACC accepted, um, but I do think it is. Is it accepted that I should know that I shouldn't know any of your secrets, that I shouldn't know anything that's going on for you? Am I when it says I am, am I yourself? That was sort of in uh, in those days, basically, they're kind of like, well, once you get married, you become like one soul and you're joined. So she's like, are you, am I supposed to be? one soul with you but only kind of in sort or limitation so she's basically like a only kind of um keep uh keep with you at meals being like you know hang out with you at dinner time comfort your bed so have sex with you and chill out with you and give you cuddles and stuff and talk to you sometimes so like you know just pop up and be convenient this is a very feminist monologue which may be partly why i love it um, dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure oh it kills me it kills me do I am I just on the edge am I on the fringe of what you care about and what you um, good pleasure usually means kind of like things that make you happy and that you and that you care about if it be no more and it and it doesn't mean when it's it sort of sounds like when you pronounce when you say that if it be no more it sort of sounds like um, if this isn't the end of it, but what she's saying is, if it be, if it's no more than that, so if it's no more than I'm just on the edge of, of what you care about, I'm just, the next bit is Portia's Brutus harlot, not his wife. So if I'm no more than just the person that sort of hangs around on the edge and just, you know, <laughs> sits with you at dinner and has sex with you, then... I'm just your prostitute, another wife. And if you can imagine the hurt behind that, I think that's a really good place to, to go from, to understand what it would be like to... F I think she knows, she's very clever, she knows that something is going on and it's to do with those people and it's to do with Caesar. There is some bad... She's not going down... And she 
is kind of offended that he hasn't told her what's going on and that he is kind of treating her like an idiot because he's like, oh, I'm just sick. She's like, come on, it's me. Like, how dumb do you think I am? So all of those things, um, it, to me, that uh, if you notice that as well, the rhythm at the beginning is brutus sick and is it physical to walk and brace and suck up the humours of it? Don't mind what is brutus sick? That's very tra la 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 It, to me, is quite... Um, feels it blows in that rhythm quite well and then as it goes on it starts to get a bit more so I'm just gonna do this so I can make sure you can see me um, <clears throat> it gets a bit wobbly so within the bond of marriage within the bond of marriage tell me Brutus is it accepted I should know no secrets that pertain to you that appertain to you and my yourself but as it were it's all a limitation oh that's interesting sorry now that I've done that can you hear that actually it does fit quite well? So to me, what that tells me is because she is able to manage her language so well in that sort of heat of argument, it means that she is on fire mentally. So there's no, to me, there's no sort of confusion there. It's like, it's fierce and it's sharp and she knows exactly what she wants to say to him. It's powerful. She's a powerful, powerful woman. So definitely I would work with some actions to make sure that you're playing each section slightly differently and making sure you're kind of um, bringing some variety to that and that it has some, some build to it as well. So even if you start with attack, especially if it's for an audition, you might wanna pull back slightly after that because it's no good having a monologue that's attack, attack, attack the whole way through or even attack crying and getting really dramatic and no one wants that for a couple of minutes on stage that's too much so if you start with attack then pull it back or if you don't if it doesn't need to be for an audition if you're not going to get sort of if it's an exam or something and <laughs> people aren't going to switch you off straight away you could be a bit more sar sarcastic or a bit more playful at the start and and just maybe be a bit more chill and maybe she's just trying to suss it out a bit more i hope that's helpful i think that with this one, you really need to stretch out some of the adjectives in terms of things that you're stressing. Because the language is simple, you don't need to worry too much about making sure that people understand it. I would be thinking more about what words you connect to and how. So things like, oh sorry, I just lost it. Things like the dark morning, I would be stretching out those vowels and um, the vile contagion, wholesome bed, these little sort of couplets words that she says to um, really make sure that you've got an image in your head of what those are and make sure you're playing with them in different ways. When I was stressing them just then, so I just went dark morning, vile contagion, wholesome bed. I'm actually just, that was the same. Did you hear that? I'm doing the same kind of pitch and intonation and stretch. Don't do that. <laughs> make sure that you're um, stressing in different ways. So whether it might be um, making sure that you're getting a little bit diff of a different pitch, like maybe holes in bed might be lower because it's a little bit flirty, but then a vile contagion might have a little bit of a different quality. It could be a bit higher pitched. Um, it could have a slightly different, um, uh, maybe a bit more spit on. Vile contagion, use, use the spit on the adjectives, I mean, sorry, on the uh, consonants. These are just things to play with. So play with... Um, attack on consonants, stretching out vowels, pitch, um, speed, all those kind of regular things that you would do just in performance generally. And I don't think you need to worry so much about whether people understand this one. I think that people will understand it, especially if you understand. So your first job, if you haven't done this yet, is to make sure you really, really understand every single little bit. And then from there, making sure that you can connect to this very, very powerful woman and you understand what she's going through and what she wants to get out of her stupid husband who is just not living up to his end of the bargain. I hope you enjoyed that. And um, yeah, let me know if you've got any questions or any other monologues you'd like me to tackle.